Good evening and welcome to the Lessons from a Lifelong Learner program. My name is Tom Butcher. I'm the General Counsel for Grand Valley State University and a member of the President's Senior Management Team. President Haas uh, extends his uh, sincere regrets that he cannot be here with you tonight, um, that uh, he is actually at a uh, birthday party, if you will, to celebrate uh, 99 years of Ralph Hauenstein, and so we have that going on in another location uh, uh, at the university. And because I have served for and with our three panelists tonight, that uh, I volunteered to uh, pinch hit for the president, so it's a, a particular treat for me to be able to do so. Tonight's program is based upon Professor Randy Posh's last lecture program, and our theme is Lessons from a Lifelong Learner. So what is a lifelong learner? According to the US Department of Education, which has as its goal, all learners will have engaging and empowering learning experiences, both in and out of school, that prepare them to be active, creative, knowledgeable, and ethical participants in our globally networked society. According to the CBS Interactive Business Network, Lifelong learning is a continuous building of skills and knowledge throughout the life of an individual. It occurs through experiences encountered in the course of a lifetime. These experiences could include formal, such as training, counseling, tutoring, mentorship, apprenticeship, and higher education, or informal, such as experiences and situations. And I can assure you that the panelists put me through my paces in all of those respects. Um, in Europe, the Commission of European Communities expressed that lifelong learning not only enhances social inclusion, active citizenship, and personal development, but also competitiveness and employability. So no matter our station in life, no matter where we are on life's pathway, we are all learners and teachers in the lifelong process. Tonight's three speakers have been instrumental in the development of tens of thousands of students as key leaders of Grand Valley for over 30 years. As one of those who benefited from the tutelage of Don Lubbers, Glenn Niemeyer, and Ron Van Steelen, I am deeply grateful and appreciative, so thank you to all three of you. To formally introduce our speakers, it is fitting that a Grand Valley student do so. Allison Pentecost is from Holt, Michigan, and is a senior at Grand Valley, and she'll be graduating this April. Woohoo! Good deal. She's been involved in various service projects and organizations on campus and has held leadership positions in the Residential Housing Association, RHA, student organization, and as a resident assistant in Housing and Residence Life. Allison became involved in RHA as a freshman. She became vice president of programming in the fall of 2008 and president at the end of winter in 2009, a position she continues to enjoy and lead. In this leadership position over the past two years, she's attended statewide conferences as Grand Valley's representative. Allison prides herself in intentional programming and residential interaction to engage students outside of the classroom, so she is also a learner and a teacher. Her motto for the position is, once an RA, always an RA. After graduation, Allison plans to attend graduate school in a Family Studies Early Childhood Development Program. Please join me in welcoming Allison Pentecost to the podium. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, the first of our three speakers tonight is Glenn Niemeyer. Um, Glenn Niemeyer arrived at Grand Valley in 1963 when its enrollment was only 224 people. He was eager to begin his job as an assistant professor. When he retired in 2001 as the university's first provost, Niemeyer left a growing campus with an enrollment of more than 18,500 students. 
Nehemiah received a bachelor's degree from Calvin College. He then taught junior high at Grand Haven Christian School before enrolling at Michigan State University. He earned a master's and doctoral degrees from Michigan State and was named assistant professor of history at Grand Valley in 1963. He rose through the faculty ranks to be named professor of history, then assumed administrative roles as dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in 1960, vice president for academic affairs in 1976, and provost in 1980. In 2008, Grand Valley rededicated the Glenn A. Nehemiah Living and Learning Center at its new location on Calder Drive. University leaders named an annual awards program that honors students and faculty members for Nehemiah. The awards are presented to people who strive for excellence in all aspects of the academic experience. Please help me welcome up Glenn Nehemiah. Allison, thank you for that kind introduction. I, uh, I was thrilled to be able to get up those steps, but I can tell you that I'll be ecstatic if I'm able to get down. <laughs> um, before I begin, I really want to thank Beth and Lena for all that they've done in order to put this together. This is the second time that they scheduled this event. Last year, uh, I was the one who had to ask them to cancel it, and they were kind enough to uh, reschedule it for uh, this evening. So I really want to thank you for your persistence in uh, putting this event together tonight. It was in the uh, last years that I was at Grand Valley that we in uh, the Academic and Student Affairs Division put together what we came to call the Academic Leadership Roundtable. We uh, thought that since we were hiring so many new people in an administrative positions that we probably ought to do something to help prepare them for the positions that they were holding. And so we put together the leadership roundtable. We asked 16 people each year, and I think we did this for about six years, to participate. And in order to participate, they had to promise that they would attend all of the sessions. The sessions were held in February and March for about eight weeks, and on each Thursday during that time, they would come at three o'clock for the first session. We would then break to eat for about five to six o'clock, and then a second session from six until eight. And the sessions were um, held by people who were in administrative positions at Grand Valley to try to acquaint the new people with who they are, who they were, and what kind of functions and responsibilities each office had. It was during that time that uh, one occasion I was sitting in my office and uh, with not much anything else to do, so I just started diddling around, and I began to write things down on a piece of paper. And then I thought, well, if I keep going, I might be able to get 10 of these. And so I did, I finally got 10, and I thought there was some precedence for 10, but then I began to ask myself, what should I call them? I thought, you know, it was too much of a stretch to try to make too big a comparison. But I thought, well, let's see what we could call them. And I finally came up with the word maxim. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, one of the definitions of maxim is a statement of general truth. So I thought, well, that sounds pretty heady. Why don't I just call them 10 maxims? Half the people won't even know what they are anyway and so the other half will have to find out or tell them. And so that's what I did. Now when I'm finished, if you're disappointed, if you think that Maxim is too big or asks too much of you to accept, then I want to tell you that, you know, for the other 10, a person had to go to the top of a mountain. In my case, I just sat around in my office writing a few things down. So with that, I want to turn to 10 Maxims. And the outline here is pretty straightforward. I tell you what a maxim is. I make a few comments about it, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. I do that 10 times, after which there's a conclusion. So that's the outline of what I'm going to say. The first maxim, if you can't remember it, 
you're not likely to do it. I don't know how true that's been for you, but it's been almost exactly the right thing every time. If I ever think about it, I seldom do it. If I do, it's only by accident. And in that context, I want to say that I served on quite a number of long-range planning committees. Now, this is not a knock against long-range plans, but it seems that when people sit down to write long-range plans, as we did for this university, they always want to concentrate on the goals and objectives. And they sometimes think that the value of the long-range plan is the number of goals and objectives that you can write. And typically, when we sat around in these committees, the longer we sat, the more goals and objectives we had, which I always thought made it even that much more difficult to remember what we had written. And again, I thought, if you can't remember it, you're not likely to do it. But I also remember a time when there was a goal that we had in mind. During the early years of Grand Valley, there was frequently talk about closing this university, or on some occasions turning it into a prison of all things. And what we came up with as a goal was really very difficult, very, very complicated. It was called get more students. And everyone, everyone on campus knew exactly what that meant. All of us put our heads together in order to see that we could get more students. And you know what? We never forgot what that goal was, and we were successful. Number two, have physicians on issues and stick to them but you don't have to be dogmatic. In other words, take a position on something and hold to that, but you don't have to keep repeating it. People usually understand the first time, and if they don't, you can repeat it. But if they still don't get it, they won't get it anyway, no matter how many times you say it. But to have a position, stay, stick to it, define it, and make sure that you're consistent in holding to it. Number three. Friendliness is an asset, especially if it is genuine, but competence is a prerequisite of success. There's nothing wrong in being friendly, and there are some people who are very friendly, but I've also met people who thought if they were just friendly, were good friends to enough people that somehow or other they could guarantee their success in the position they held. And I want to tell you, after a while that really grows old. People really respect competence. And it doesn't mean you can't be friendly and competent too, but you must be competent in order to do well at the position you hold. Number four, honesty is still the best policy. If you are honest, you won't have to keep track of what you said to whom. You ought to be able to remember. People are always watching when you're in administrative positions, and maybe always, everyone, people are always watching to see once whether you're honest. And they expect you to be consistent in that. I recall a time at Grand Valley when we had on the Board of Control a vice president from General Motors. And his responsibility at GM was labor relations. In other words, he carried out negotiations with the labor unions. There was a time when the board had a retreat, and it was at that retreat that I had the opportunity to talk with him for a while. And he said if he was ever dishonest with the UAW representatives, they would not negotiate with him again. And that's true for you and I, too, in whatever positions we hold. And I can recall serving on a lot of committees with faculty. And in an organization as big as Grand Valley, there are always rumors circulating. And I also recall that most often there was some truth to the rumors that were going around campus. And there was always that occasion when some faculty member would suddenly say, what do you know about this? And suddenly that room would become extremely quiet. Half of the people sitting around the table would look down and the other half would look straight at you, trying to dare you not to tell them the truth. And I had that a number of occasions. And there were some times when I could say to them, let's talk about that. I can perhaps add some things to what you already know. But there were other times when I said to them, that's something I can't talk about with you now. 
When I can, I'll let you know and we'll discuss it then. The point I'm trying to make is there are different ways that you can be honest and truthful. Number five, respect all others. They deserve it. Some people have a hierarchy of respect for others. That is, the more important they think the position that this person holds, the more respect they want to give them, and vice versa. If they don't have the respect for the position they hold, less respect for the individual. And I'm telling you that irregardless of the position that a person holds, every one of us deserves everyone else's respect. That's why you have people, because you need them, and because they contribute to the success of the entire enterprise. Treat everyone well, and they in turn will contribute to the success of what it is that you're trying to accomplish, and they will infor feel important to the success of it. Number six, do what is right. Often the immediate response is, how do I know what is right? The fact of the matter is, usually you and I know what is right. We don't have to be told what the right thing to do. We know what is the right thing to do. And it isn't because we don't know it that we don't do it. It's something else that's making us hesitant. For example, we might not like the person who's involved in our doing what is right. There may be something in the past that keeps, makes us hesitant to do what is right. The issue is knowing what is right and whether we're willing to act on it. I recall that one time I was in my office and a call came and the person on the line spoke to me and said, I really want you to take on this assignment. It seemed like I was unusually busy at that time, and so I said to the person, well, I, I really don't want to do that. I, I don't have the time to do that now, and I think I should, uh, should just tell you no. And she said, well, I, I really do want you to do this. I think you're the person who should do this. And I said, well, you know, why don't you get somebody else? There are a lot of competent people that you could ask. Why don't you ask someone else? And for a third time, she said, I really want you to do this. And then added, just think how good you'll feel when it's over. <laughs> and I said to her, okay, I'll do it. And you know what? She was right. I really felt good when it was over. Not just because it was over, it was done. But I felt good because we had been able to assist an institution that had real troubles, real problems, and we were to help them in substantive ways. Number seven, humility is a virtue in short supply. Most of us will never get enough of it. I have met a few people who took pride in their humility, but most of us are just genuinely proud. And what we need to do is to take a good look at ourselves, not see ourselves as we think we appear, but take a good look at ourselves and see if we can figure out how others see us. And if we're able to do that, usually we'll get a much more realistic view of ourselves than just looking at ourselves. Number eight, be aware that's be aware, not beware, be aware of the law of inevitability. It's a law that exists all around us all of the time, and it's most often occasioned by the fact that whatever the organization or institution, or in many instances, countries, are unable to continue their ability toward a given objective. Now, that sounded a little complicated, let me see if I can simplify it. The United States currently, in my opinion, is after two objectives and is having some difficulty sustaining the ability to pursue it. And you find it both in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
The inevitability is that there will come a time when the U.S. will withdraw from both of those countries under whatever pretense we don't know. That exists all over, and it existed at Grand Valley as well. And there was a time that Grand Valley had an academic organization into separate colleges and increasingly had difficulty sustaining that academic network. There came a time when we decided to reorganize into separate divisions. And the key always to the law of inevitability is that you become aware of it and then act appropriately. Not, not sooner than others also see the inevitability and not so late that you cannot fill the vacuum that you will create as a result. Number nine, inherent within us, each of us, is the potential to get carried away with ourselves. And you see that all of the time. I could point to many lessons from history. All you gotta do is look at World War I or World War II. And you had that inherent ability to get carried away with oneself on both sides, both in the Axis powers as well as the Allied. And sometimes it also gets amusing because if you read any history, you'll also see it between President Truman and General MacArthur. It was who was gonna come first and who was gonna to have to wait for who. That's called the, inability, the ability to get carried away with yourselves. It is a pitfall that often each of us runs into and it makes each of us vulnerable when we do because it's the time when we think too much of ourselves, too much, we're too powerful, we're too smart, we're too good looking, we're too clever, too whatever it is. And on those occasions, we get carried away with ourselves. And each of us needs someone in our lives that tells us when that happens. Someone who is close enough to us that we're willing to listen, if not immediately, later say, I think they may have something to tell me. Someone we trust, and then we better make sure that we're listening. And number 10, there is more to life than your job. Put it in proper perspective and you will do better at it. Well, there's another gr group. They ought to be told that they ought to put the job in their life. I'm not talking to that group. I'm talking to the group where thinks their job is their whole life. Sometimes we get carried away with it. We don't think we will. And it doesn't happen all at once. It happens gradually, gradually. And increasingly, we're pulled into thinking, if we just work longer, if we just work harder, if we just do all of that, we'll do better. The fact of the matter is, when we do, we're often taking away from another role in life that we have to play. What other role? Wherever we think we can get away with it. And typically, where we think we can get away with it is right at home. We take advantage of our families as a result. Put it all in perspective and you will do better at all of the roles that you play. Well, I suppose if you've been paying attention, you should have had 10. But if you perhaps let your mind wander, you might only have nine. And you know, I've always sort of have a feeling for those people who come up with nine. There's always someone who has nine, and they keep telling their, asking their neighbor, what's the tenth one? You have ten. And so knowing that that's a, a difficult position for anyone to be in, I'll give you another one. So you either have ten or eleven. So you can go home and say, I got all ten. Many years ago when I came to Grand Valley, I was a member of the history department. And uh, during the time that I was in that department, we had several different secretaries. On this particular occasion, we had one who was extremely competent, but I thought really quite moody. I'm not sure she was that way with all members of the department, but she sure was with me. I just thought that she didn't have a full appreciation 
of all aspects of my personality. <laughs> and as a result, we went into these periods of what I'll call lack of appreciation. And it was on one of these occasions when I asked her if she would type a paper for me, and this was in the pre-computer days. And so it was commonplace to ask the secretary to type papers, type exams for you, and so forth. And so I gave this paper to her, and she took it. A few days later, she came back, and um, she said, I've got your paper typed. She said, there are a few errors on it, though, but I thought it would be OK. So I took the paper from her, and I looked down, and I immediately saw several errors, typo errors, typographical errors. And as I handed it back to her, I said, your best is never too good. And it is on that note that I will close. Remember, your best is never too good. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing those 10 11 with us. Um, I feel like maxim is a perfect word for those. You did a really good job. Okay. Um, so our second speaker is um, Ron Van Steeland. Ron Van Steeland started working at Grand Valley in 1966 as the college's first personal officer. In fact, one of his duties was to establish a personal department. In 1968, he became the university's business manager and then was promoted to vice president of the college in 1973. In 1979, Van Steelen became vice president for finance and administration, a position he held until his retirement in 2001. With rigor and intensity, Van Steelen guided the university through a period of enormous growth. He was trusted advisor to President Emeritus Don Lubbers from the time where there were just 2,000 students through the university's explosive expansion and enrollment programs and facilities. After retiring, Van Steelen received an honorary doctorate in humane letters. He also received the Don Lubbers Award for service to the university. And in 2009, the university celebrated Van Steelen's contributions by renaming a living center on the south end of Allendale's campus in his name. Please help me welcome up Ron Van Steelen. Thank you, Allison. My topic this evening is the importance of humor and laughter in our lives. I will review with you how humor and laughter affect us physically and emotionally, how we might more, use more of it in our daily lives and while we're in college and later on in the workplace. According to Psychology Today, we involuntarily somehow laugh at just the right times without consciously knowing why we do it. Most people think of laughter as a simple response to a comedy or a joke. Instead, after 10 years of research, scientists have concluded that laughter is primarily a social vocalization that binds people together, sort of a hidden language that we all speak. Laughter is very social, and scientists found that it is 30 times more frequent in social situations than when we're alone. However happy we may feel, laughter is a signal we send to others, and it virtually disappears when we don't have an audience. As anyone who has ever laughed at the sight of someone doubled over with laughter can attest, laughter is indeed very contagious. Since our laughter is not under our conscious control, it is usually totally spontaneous and pretty much uncensored. Funny things can be even funnier if they happen at inappropriate times. For example, a loud burp at a funeral. Or watching a lecturer or preacher who is wearing an obvious toupee and it's on crooked. 
A favorite is when you're sitting in a restaurant and someone comes out of the restroom with toilet paper stuck to his shoes. If you try not to laugh, it can actually make the urge to laugh out loud even more urgent and contagious. Laughter and humor have a positive impact on us at all ages. A sense of humor really develops early. Children laugh long before they start to speak. We know that babies laugh and giggle and smile before they learn to talk. Even the earliest laughter can be encouraged by playing peekaboo. The impact of humor on the elderly is also very clear. A scientist recently found that aging adults who were exposed to humor and laughed more frequently reported much greater coping skills in their lives. Humor can really have a positive effect on people of all ages with illnesses. Laughter is really good medicine. Laughter takes our mind off our troubles because it diverts our attention and gives us a break, uh, a break when things are too difficult otherwise. One cancer surgeon wrote, quote, show me a patient who is able to laugh and play, who enjoys living, and I'll show you someone who's going to live longer, unquote. Laughter has also been proven to lower blood pressure in those with hypertension, to stimulate production of endor endorphins, the brain's built-in painkiller, to lower blood glucose in people with type 2 diabetes. Finally, a 2007 study proved that laughing even boosted energy expenditure by 10 to 20 percent, thereby burning extra calories. This is one, I'm, this is one finding I'm personally going to pay more attention to. First, let's look at humor at home and in our daily lives. Sometimes the best place to observe lightheartedness is in our everyday routine. Do kids make you laugh? If so, focus on their endearing comments or actions. You can enjoy this nearly anywhere. Pets are great for providing comedy relief. As they say, cats and dogs can do the darndest things. Another idea, try reading the Onion newspaper, either online or through a subscription. The paper's claim to fame is its fake news stories, which relate to contemporary events. It is free and often found in college towns and urban centers. This is one I just picked up a little while ago in Austin, Texas. You've seen them, I hope. Some recent headlines in this paper included, quote, Boy Scout troop fulfills volunteering badge obligation by agreeing to give women breast exams. Quote, Congo provides, the Congo approves economic stimulus package which provides an AK-47 for every citizen. The Onion also has terrific video and audio podcasts which you can download and now there's even a weekly TV show. A simple way to access your lighter side is to watch humor in action. Find a couple of TV shows that you, watch, that you can watch regularly and with your friends. I really love the show, It Only Hurts When I Laugh. How many of you have ever seen that show? It's a Canadian show, but it's on uh, our, our channels down here. It consists of actual home videos sent in by real people who have done something incredibly stupid in their daily lives, which resulted in a hilarious accident. The show's motto is, there's nothing funnier than the pain, humiliation, or stupidity we can witness in other people. <laughs> I predict that you can't watch this program without laughing out loud. Many of you probably already watch Real Time with Bill Maher and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and others like that. I like the way they include the daily news, the news of the day, in their stand-up routines. Two others I'd recommend to you are Curb Your Enthusiasm, an ongoing story about the daily life of Larry David, who was the producer of the Seinfeld series, and All in the Family, a real old 1970s show about one of the world's most lovable bigots, Archie Bunker. Try downloading a joke of the day on your cell phone from, money, uh, from one of the many online services. I predict that you won't be able to resist sending some of these jokes to your friends or family. 
I know I do this. I'm guilty of this at least a couple of times a week. Another idea is to introduce humor at the family Thanksgiving dinner. These events can really be deadly. Sometimes. Lighten up the mood with some jokes or short stories. Be sure to include something for everyone, all ages. For the older folks like your grandparents, you can always ask them to tell a funny story about their childhood or school days. They are always, there are also great elderly jokes on the internet which they would enjoy. Always involve the kids at the Thanksgiving table. Ask them to bring a new joke. Knock-knock jokes, elephant jokes, or whatever they just heard at school, any of those will do just fine. My young granddaughters love telling these jokes, and I think they enjoy doing the research as well. Next, let's look for a minute at humor in college. At first, we might think that humor would be hard to find in the collegiate setting. What would the competition students feel and the pressures of studying, preparing for exams, writing papers? On the contrary, I suggest that there are lots of opportunities for humor at college. For example, a professor in a study abroad class of students on their way to France handed out some real life examples of mistranslations from French to English to make his point. Here are two from this professor's handout. First, a sign posted in the de Gaulle airport outside Paris read in English, quote, we take your bags and send them in all directions. Second, on the door of a Parisian tourist office, a sign read, quote, if this is your first visit to Paris, you are welcome to it. <laughs> I'll bet the students love this class handout. I won't read the others to you. Another idea is to read the book, Non-Campus Mentis. I love this book. It's a collection of exact statements made by students in term papers or on final exams. Over the years, the professor and author of this book saved the most ridiculous statements made by his students. Here are just a few. Quote, prehistoric people spent all day banging rocks together so that they could find something to eat. This was called the stoned age. <laughs> Quote, Civilization woozed out of the Nile about 300,000 years ago. The Nile was a river that had some water in it. Every year it would flood and irritate the land. This tended to make the people nervous. Quote, Joan of Arc was famous as Noah's wife. Quote, Men during this period were usually about 30 years old and women only 12 or 13. <laughs> this book is full of authentic and sometimes tragic examples of the thinking of some American college students. Fortunately, none of them were from Grand Valley. <laughs> Another wonderful example of the introduction of tongue-in-cheek humor in the college setting is the annual awarding of the Ig Nobel Prize awards at Harvard. The prizes are a parody of the real Nobel Prizes and are given each year for 10 achievements that, quote, first make people laugh and then make them think. Some of the recent honorees of the Ig Nobel Prize included the Public Health Prize winner, one for her invention, a brassiere that, in an emergency, can be quickly converted into a pair of protective face masks, one for the bra wearer and one to be given to some needy bystander. <laughs> the management prize went to a team of researchers for demonstrating mathematically that organizations would become more efficient if they promoted people at random. The engineering prize went to some scientists for perfecting a method for collecting whale snot using a remote control helicopter. I, I couldn't make this stuff up, really. 
I think these Ig Nobel Prize examples suggest that sometimes we take our collegiate experiences too seriously. For those of you who are students, I suggest that you also consider a joke party occasionally with your friends and roommates. Sometimes the research for these parties can be half the fun. I really applaud the idea of your last Laker standing competition every year in February in which students compete as stand-up comics right here in the Kirchhoff Center. One of your recent competitors included this line in his monologue. Why is it we say tuna fish, but we don't say chicken bird? <laughs> By the way, don't forget to attend some of the Laugh Fest events in downtown Grand Rapids this week, sponsored by Gilda's Club. Next, let's explore humor in the workplace. According to a recent survey, employers listed sense of humor as one of the critical attributes of a good employee. Further, it is considered essential for managers to have a sense of humor. An article in Nation's Business magazine identified a sense of humor as one of the seven qualities which great bosses have. This includes the ability to laugh at themselves. If you can't laugh at yourself, people may often view you as being too critical. Unfortunately, humor in the workplace can also alienate people and create a more hostile work environment. Be sure to think of the message and know your audience. If you're not sure how a joke or story will be received, it's best not to tell it. I spoke earlier about how humor helps sick people to relieve stress and even help them to heal more quickly. Now we also know that humor helps nurses and other healthcare staff to deal with their stress so that they are more effective with their patients. Researchers have found that work and play do indeed mix. Here are their findings. Humor strengthens a team identity and team spirit. The idea is that if an individual employees feel like a meaningful part of a larger whole, they are more likely to take the initiative to do whatever is necessary to achieve the goals of the team. Glenn was just talking about that a few minutes ago. Humor can also help to boost creativity. Researchers have documented that employees with a better sense of humor tend to be more creative, a very important consideration in today's economy. Humor also improves communication. A good sense of humor supports good communication by removing barriers between management and non-management staff, facilitating awkward communications, and softening the emotional tone of communications. It is also a powerful ally in conducting effective meetings. Humor energizes employees physically and emotionally. Company leaders have made finding ways to revitalize their workforce a top priority. Most people use their weekends to revitalize themselves. By building opportunities for fun and laughter, into the workplace, the employer can provide an opportunity for this revitalization to occur every day. Humor can also boost sales. Humor helps break down any initial objections the potential buyer has by creating a positive emotional disposition toward both the salesperson and the product. This is why radio and TV commercials now use humor so often. Humor reduces job stress. This has the effect of boosting morale, promoting good attendance, and warding off burnout. The overall impact has a positive effect on organizational performance and company profits. In your careers, you will have plenty of opportunities to consider how you might build more fun into your work situation. Here are a few suggestions from the experts. Hire competent employees who have a sense of humor. Be sure humor and fun are encouraged by top management. Provide challenging work. Encourage spontaneity on the job. Pay attention to what progressive companies and organizations like Google 
and other similar companies are doing in the workplace. Have an item at, let's have an item at our desk or workstation which makes us laugh or smile. One idea is a humorous picture of your pet or your, maybe your favorite cartoon. One person I know has a rubber chicken hanging by a rope in her desk drawer. <laughs> I remember lots of times in my Grand Valley career when humor played an important role in my job. I especially remember one time, and my colleagues here will too, when we were in a meeting discussing very painful budget cuts we had to make because of state funding reductions. These cuts were going to lead to layoffs of valuable faculty and staff and reduction in critical programs. While we were meeting, and this was in the library, while we were meeting, there was a protest or picket line outside our window by students who were involved in the heated debate about our policy which prohibited dogs in classrooms and on campus generally. There were lots of people with very strong feelings on both sides of the dog issue. It was hard not to laugh out loud, though, at the relative insignificance of the dog policy at a time when so many other important issues were on the table. I hope that all of us will take seriously how we can increase humor in our daily lives. I hope I gave you a couple of ideas which you can use. I feel privileged to share the podium this evening with my former colleagues and good friends, Don Lovers and Glenn Niemeyer. Thank you for humoring me by giving me your attention. Thank you for sharing your insights on humor and laughter. I too believe it is a very important part of daily life. Our third and final speaker today is Don Lubbers. <laughs> Don Lubbers became president of Grand Valley State University in 1969 at the age of 37 making him one of the youngest college presidents in the nation. When he retired in 2001, he was the longest serving public university president in the country. During those 32 years, Lubbers led Grand Valley's evolution from a small college to a regional university. Lubbers was the president of Central College in Pella, Iowa when he rec was recruited by William Seedman to be the second president of Grand Valley State University. Lubbers guided Grand Valley's response to regional business and industry needs with the establishment of professional programs in health sciences, nursing, business, engineering, social work, and education. Today, these are some of the strongest programs in the Midwest. He saw the need for Grand Valley's presence in downtown Grand Rapids and led effort, efforts to construct the Eberhard Center in the mid-1980s. The Pew Grand Rapids campus has since expanded to include student housing, the DeVos Center, the Keller Engineering Laboratory, and the Cook DeVos Center for Health Sciences. Lubbers is a native of Holland and a graduate of Hope College, where his father, Erwin Lubbers, served as president. He earned a master's degree in history from Rutgers University in 1956, then taught at, at Wittenberg College before returning to Rutgers in 1958 to pursue a doctorate. Please help me welcome up Don Lovers. Thank you, Allison. You know, when you say he was the longest serving president, that means he was a very old man when he <laughs> retired. The humor speech was a little humorous relief before a very serious speech that I'm going to give, but I remember the humor. It really did get us through. I'm not sure that we could tell all the jokes that we used to tell each other. 
but it was a great sense of relief. The invitation for this speech was predicated on the special and poignant address by Professor Randy Posh when his death was imminent because he was learned, passionate, a man with a young family, what he said and how he said it attracted, deserved attention and became a model for programs such as the one tonight. Pa, uh, <clears throat> though my age, at, at my age, thoughts of mortality play around more consciously in my mind than previously, I don't feel the urgency felt by Randy Posh. In John Irving's book, The Life of Owen Meany, Owen Meany discovers at an early age the date he is going to die. It affects his whole life, which is relatively short, and focuses his mind. Professor Posh had an Owen Meany experience, but of a much shorter duration. I am not in the position of the fictional Owen Meany nor the real Randy Posh. If I was, I might say something quite different from what I'm going to offer you this evening. Finality is not yet driving me. The theme is set by Professor Posh's experience and profundities are expected. He faced death and he had to assess who he was and what was important to him. All the people close to him, all the people who shaped him, and the most important of his beliefs were focused in the event which sets our stage tonight. His experience set me thinking about the making of a person. How do we become who we are and what we think and do? We inherit our genes and live among people with whom we have experiences. The exploration of the importance of genes and human environment continues and provides thought-provoking speculations. As I reflect, I have knowledge of and memories of people who profoundly affected my life. Through them, I was taught and inspired. My philosophy of life was shaped. Everything I believe has antecedents in the experiences I have had with people or what they have written or performed. As my Polish massage therapist says after he tackles a deep philosophical subject while fixing my lower back, Think about it. Yes, think about it. So much of you derives from others. Those who live when you do, and those who shape the understandings and beliefs of the culture into which you were born. And yet, with all the infusion from beyond ourselves, and the genes we inherit from parents and ancestors, a self-conscious individual emerges, one who possesses and is limited by his or her consciousness, who holds for himself or herself beliefs and emotions, and has her or his own thoughts. Our individuality is intertwined with others, yet separate. As Posh was about to surrender his individual consciousness, he decided to speak from that sensitivity, sharing what was most important to him, importance that reflected his lifetime accumulation 
of human interaction and his biological and cultural inheritance. His timing was good, if sad, and he died with a valedictory on his lips. I am happy that I speak to you without his motivating compunction, but as I have indicated, I am interested in the relationships that make us who we are. If we had to speak as he did, what is there about each of us which would formulate our words? I keep coming back to the people of our lives and the profound influence some of them have on us. Their imprint would fashion what we say. While you think about who made you as you are, I will share a few names with you of those who create me. I use the present tense because I think we are all a work in progress. I had the luck of the draw when it comes to parents. They live positively and productively. They lived long and they had sadness in their lives. They were nurturers and they were visionaries. They were close to their parents and to their extended family. What indelibility did that leave on me? Their rock-solid love gave me a sense of security that conditions my relationships and helps me in time of failure and doubt. Their approach to life helped me find purpose in mine. They lived on an intellectual le level that stimulated my mind and a personal level that helped me understand trust. I not only love them, I admire them so much that I wanted to live my life as they had lived theirs, and I have been fortunate enough to do so. Was there a downside? Well, in my early and more naive years, I thought everyone lived with integrity, and trust was a constant human condition one can become quite satisfied when one knows. There's a price to pay when one learns he does not. And I paid those prices on occasion. Now many have teacher stories and I have mine. I don't know what causes the light in the mind to be turned on, but often a teacher throws the switch. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, singing hymns unbidden, till the world is wrought, till the world is wrought to sympathy with hope and fears it heeded not. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. I was 16, a high, high school junior in Miss Lillian Van Dyke's literature class. There were many treasures she revealed to me, but Shelley's Ode to a Skylark is one that remains vivid in my mind. I was made aware of how important words are to me. The words of poets imparted meanings that I was ready to apprehend. They made me aware of my emotions, deeper and more wide-ranging the direction of my literary and, motion, and emotional life was set on a course. The reading and listening during that semester contributed to the nature and definition of my mind. Now, it is probably too much to ascribe to a single teacher and a single course 
the self-awareness I've just described. But perhaps not. While I was in graduate school, my favorite professor from college days came to a nearby theological seminary to lecture. In college, he was the key that opened the door to Descartes, Kant, Kierkegaard, Hegel, Heidegger, and on and on. All the penetrations of reality intrigued me. He was a person who enlarged my intellect. His lectures at the seminary, hazily remembered after 55 years, made a point that surprised me from this master of theological and philosophical systems. Reality is discovered in personality and relationship, relationships between and among individuals. I suppose he was explaining to these Christian seminarians that their common religion had more to do with what Jesus did and expressed as a person than the historical and theological trappings that are attached to him. I was brought up on such hymns as living with Jesus and what a friend we have in Jesus. Certainly, these catch the spirit of personal relationship first and belief second. The simple and sometimes simple-minded faith has one in interesting characteristic. Jesus is friend. Read the daily obituaries in the Grand Rapids Press and you will see written out that many who have left us are allegedly immediately into, into, taken immediately into his intimate circle of friends. Now, whatever the truth of the matter, it points to a deep subconscious understanding that we find ourselves in the personalities and relationships with others. Dr. D. Ivan Dykstra, my Hope College professor, is the antecedent of this concept in my pantheon of first concepts and is responsible for what I'm saying tonight. Now, I have briefly described intimacy with the second person in the Christian three-person understanding of God. But what about intimacy on earth amongst the living? Who taught me that? After one false start, I must say marriage has. Marriage offers a special opportunity for the mingling of two personalities and the best shot at growing self-awareness. Many adjustments are required and oh, so many overlookings. There are no guarantees that it will work. But when it does, you discover how deeply bonding a relationship can be, how, how necessary one person can be to another, how contentment and happiness thrive. But even when good things falter or have never flourished abundantly in a marriage, we often see a sometimes hostile dependency that is anchored in emotional cement. All prove my point that relationship is foremost. By whatever lights that lead you to conclusion, marriage is instituted for procreation and care of human offspring. Our families emerge with more chances for happy, purposeful relationships. And we know those relationships often go bad. Whichever way, our lives are powerfully impacted. A marriage has not always worked well, which the numbers who avoid it prove. I am not claiming that the self-discovery which can emerge from intimacy is exclusively found in marriage. That's just where I found it. Between unmarried friends, it may be found. The long-standing religious and cultural disapproval of some gender intimacy should be reconsidered. If scriptures are invoked, 
any current mindset can be justified. Allowing people to experience and grow through commitment, long-term caring, continual sharing of thoughts and goods, and also the satisfaction of a sexual activity while it is needed, is as good as the human condition gets. I don't think it should be denied to those who want it and can find it. That's what I find in the scriptures, and it coincides with my observations. I will bring this discourse to a close with a description of a relationship that taught me in my professional years about ambition, teamwork, integrity, trust, and self-fulfillment. I will attempt to explain the relationship I had with the two speakers who preceded me and the relationship that existed among the three of us. The positions we held when we retired started more than 30 years ago. I don't remember how many. What did we bring to the table? Each was ambitious, self-confident, dominant, intelligent, generally of a friendly nature, possessed of def definite opinions, and of distinctively different personalities. You will agree, I think, these are qualities of a leader, but they are not necessarily compatible with cooperative leadership. There can be a centrifugal force attached to them that accommodates only individual leadership. Now that did not happen to us. The three of us, each at our own time, decided to place his professional eggs in one basket, Grand Valley State University. Why were we able to do that? And I answer for myself, these are two honest men. They don't embarrass themselves by lying in an officer relationship. Now they gamed me from time to time, <laughs> but they were honest with me. These are two highly competent men. Both did their jobs as well as anyone in the nation, and I'm not exaggerating, it's fact. The proof is what they left when they retired. These are two loyal men. I entrusted them with my striving for success and they never let me down. I tried to do the same for them. In the professional per personal relationship I had with Glenn Emer and Ron Van Steelen, I learned and incorporated into myself some profound understandings. I experienced professional comp accomplishment that was dependent upon the relationship I had with each of them. Success was interdependent and overcoming professional failure was always a team project. We respected each other, but their honesty, competence, and loyalty elicited from me affection too. I learned that I could be a demanding CEO with high expectations and really like and be close to people who were helping meet those expectations. In retrospect, I think that is unusual. It's the exception rather than the norm. I think the substance and nuances of our rela relationship permeated the whole institution to its benefit. The nature of our relationship transcended our individuality and contributed to it and affected what really happened. Again, we see in the interaction of persons, reality is revealed. Now, explanations are often inadequate to, assess the, to, inadequate to assess the complexity and ramifications of a concept. 
I often said if 65% to 70% of the thoughts emanating from the minds on campus are positive, we are likely to treat each other better rather than worse, progress will be made, and the reality of our lives more satisfying. Now this is tough to prove, but, but it may contain that proverbial kernel of truth. Whatever happened, Glenn, Ron, and I threw in our lot with Grand Valley, mixing all our ambitions, self-confidence, talents, and personality in the university's pot. And I think we came out the fortunate ones. I think our lives made a positive difference. There are more people who deserve a place in this narrative, but time is up. I have, time is more than up. I have spoken more personally than I originally intended, but I did stay faithful to the theme. Maybe I did include some things I would say if I wasn't gonna be here tomorrow. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences as well as imparting your wisdom on us. Um, we are now done with our speakers. As we move into our question and answer session, I'd like to invite up Lena and Beth. Now they told me I was only supposed to do a short introduction, but I really feel like I should acknowledge their effort. They put together such a wonderful event. Um, Beth. Um, started as an undergraduate at Grand Valley State University um, and she loved it so much that she moved up. Um, she is now the apartment uh, director for Murray, Van Steelen, and GVA. Lena is truly the type of person who goes above and beyond. Um, she's always bright and cheerful. I don't think I've ever seen her without a smile on her face. Um, and she's the apartment director of Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Calder. Um, so let's give a round of applause for Beth and Lena and all the hard work they've done to put this together as we welcome on the stage. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you again to all the speakers. Um, we just want to take some time to let the audience ask any questions you may have to our wonder wonderful speakers. Um, there's a mic located in the middle of the aisle, so please use that as you ask questions. And if you need any assistance, please raise your hand as one of our staff will bring a wireless mic to you if you need that as well. So the floor is open for questions. All right, see a hand. <laughs> Now? Oh, wow, <laughs> now it's loud. Um, well, I'd like to start by saying uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the three of you really are uh, Grand Valley, and it's been wonderful to uh, come here and listen to your perspectives on uh, life and laughter. And uh, so my question to you is, having seen all that you've seen, what are your predictions for Grand Valley in the next 50 years? a danger in trying to speculate that far out into the future, 50 years. Um, oh, now you can hear me. Um, but I suppose in trying to uh, project that far ahead, what one does in, in some sense, I suppose, is project your own thoughts rather than your own vision. Or to put it another way, what you'd like to see Grand Valley doing rather than what it might become. And so with that understanding, let me make a comment. I think that uh, Grand Valley in the now 50 years since it was chartered has accomplished many of its goals. And for that it has ought to be duly proud. It has accomplished that in a reasonably short period of time. But it seems to me that there's always one goal 
that we never really complete. We don't complete it as individuals, and we don't complete it as, individ as uh, institutions. And that is always the one to become better. And I think the institution ought to strive to do that in all that it does, just to become better. Academically sounder, academically more respectful, academically um, a stronger reputation than it already has. And that is a, a lifetime of work, just to improve upon what it is that you already have and what it is that you already are. Well, I would sure agree with that. I, I, think, I think a comment that I would add is that I always thought we were better than our reputation. And, and one of the things that I'm very proud of today is that our reputation is growing so fast. Um, it's, it's not just that more people know about Grand Valley, it's that more people respect Grand Valley. And I, I think that's going to continue to evolve. And it's hard to guess, if you looked uh, forward 50 years from now, it's hard to guess what that might mean. I, I really don't have a clue what that means. But I think the, the right things are in place for that, the growth that uh, Glenn is talking about, the getting better part of it, the aspiration for being better, and the recognition that we're getting better. So I'm very proud of that, and I, I see that continuing to, to happen. I think all will be well and even better if there are a few concepts or maybe Glenn's maxims that the university holds to. Number one, and this is the major one, that the university always place, places top priority on undergraduate education. All of the smaller universities, teachers' colleges that turned into universities, all had the image of they wanted to be like the big one. Grand Valley was very different from that. Even when we took on the name university, make sure that your undergraduate education is the very best. And it's quite practical. You can win that way because the others don't. And look at what's happened to Grand Valley and the demand to get in this institution now because the institution held to that principle. I think that is exceedingly important. Does that denigrate graduate education? No. But what it does say is that this university is not likely to ever become a major university in research like the University of Michigan or Ohio State or Harvard. That's not the mission. You can still have good research. And that's great. And in some fields where you have graduate education, you're going to have to have a requirement from professors to do the things, some of the things that are done at the research universities. But if you don't have a, a publish or perish policy and you approach it differently, you'll be able to have the very best teaching institution. And I think that's... Now, if Grand Valley goes the other route, then I think it'll be a problem. Second thing that I think Grand Valley has benefited from that some people don't understand, this is, has a wonderful intercollegiate athletics program. You know, you don't even have to like them or go to the games. <laughs> but if that's top rate, like everything else is top rate, it really helps your institution. So I think if 
Grand Valley ever got to the point where they'd say, oh, well, I mean, it doesn't matter anymore. I think they'd lose something. If they ever got to the point where they said, oh, we've got to go Division I and we want to play the big boys and girls, they'd lose it and it would all be lost. So those are principles that I think that the, the, that the university has had and should be perpetuated. Now, what perpetuated for 500 years? I mean, who knows? But for success in the rest of this century, I think those principles have to be held to for, them, for it to succeed. And then it'll continue to succeed as it, it, as it is now. Great. Thanks again for coming. Um, appreciate your guys' insight that you gained while you're here at Grand Valley. Um, Mark Twain once said, I'd never let my schooling get in the way of my education. And so my question is, what was the most important or useful non-academic thing that you learned in college? Well, I can start again with some peril. But the thought that immediately came to mind for me was study. I, uh, I had an academic experience that was um, somewhat uneven, let's say. Uh, I had uh, graduated from high school as salutatorian in my class. And uh, I went to college. I didn't know why I was going to college. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. And so I, uh, I took a major in, in ping pong and other related activities. <laughs> and I did that for a couple of years when it suddenly dawned on me that if I'm going to stay here, maybe I ought to try to study. And literally, it was about the first time in my life that I did. Uh, it, was, um, it was a bit of a haul, because when you establish a grade point average for two years, it's really difficult to bring that up. And so I, uh, I really started studying, and as I said, the first time in my life. Uh, but fortunately, uh, it had not been too late so that after some time I was still able to get into graduate school and uh, found out that uh, if you study long enough, uh, it gets to be a habit. And it's a good one to cultivate. And uh, the, uh, the student academic life is really a pretty good one. So don't abandon it any sooner than you have to. My uh, collegiate academic experience was less than exemplary as well. And um, wh when I look back on it and, and think about it in a, in a totality, I think the experience of having to put myself through college, having to be a student full-time and uh, work almost full-time while classes were in session and then more than full-time in the summers in order to pay the bills probably was a very good experience for me. Uh, we can talk about whether that's properly balanced, but it works. And um, so I think uh, the work I had to do to make it through college is probably my most important uh, non-academic experience. Would you call, Glenn, would you call studying a non-academic experience? <laughs> well, well, Don, I think it would depend on the subject. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you can separate, you know, the, uh, what's, from academic from non-academic. I would say, looking back on my college experience, I appreciated 
but I would say uh, growing up a bit. Uh, I'm a, and that's, that's kind of academic, just a maturing of the mind, uh, having experiences that expanded your whole life and personality. Uh, I found college really very interesting and at times exciting. But uh, I guess I just reveled in the experience. I liked my fraternity life. We got into some trouble once in a while. That was a learning experience too. Uh, I like my traveling. One of the things that happened to me is I, I stayed at home for college, so it didn't cost much. I always worked for my spending money, but my dad paid the, I think the tuition at the time was $175 a semester. Don't you wish it? So that wasn't a big deal. What did that allow me to do? It allowed me to travel around. I went to Mexico one summer, and I went to Europe one summer, because I could take the money that I earned and do some of those things. And that, that was a growing experience for me and really was helpful to me. But was that academic or not? Yeah, kind of both. Once again, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your experiences. Um, my question is, what steps do you suggest Grand Valley take to increase diversity in all aspects of the institution? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Thanks. What, what steps do you suggest Grand Valley take to increase our diversity within the different aspects, whether it be racial or religious or anything along those lines? I don't know why I'm always first. <laughs> it was never that way when we were working together. <laughs> you got to speak first tonight. I did. <laughs> I did. I tell you, those go down as some of the memories I cherish the most. Um, well, okay, after a while you forget what the question was, which, which may have been the intent. No, I, I understood the question. Is what, how do you go about trying to increase diversity? And uh, I suppose I think oftentimes we make things far more complex than they really are, they need to be. And uh, I guess my answer would be be more serious and more directed and more focused to increase the diversity in the student body or in the faculty, or in the staff, or wherever it is you think you ought to be increasing the diversity. <coughs> Can it be done? I think the answer is yes. All you gotta do is put your mind to it. And typically, uh, as time went on, we, we came to discover whatever we as an institution, not just three of us, but whatever we as an institution put our minds to, we were serious about, we were able to do. And if you're gonna put your mind to that, I think you can do it today, too. I think improving diversity is very much dependent on word of mouth. I think Grand Valley has all of, all of the, the programs and initiatives in place to make that work, but I think it's very much up to individual students and individual faculty to speak for themselves. What is it like here? After all, those of us who are here are the most reliable. It isn't the publications and the advertising and, and those kinds of things that make the difference in something like assessing diversity. It's very much in the minds and hearts of the people who are here and they are very reliable when they tell their friends and uh, others at their, at their high school or whatever what it's like here. 
That's what's important. When there is a hostility toward a group of people, uh, or hostile attitudes are, are expressed, I think it's important for the leadership of the university and the board of the university to confront them, call the, call, call the people who are doing those things and saying those things, call, out, call them on it. That doesn't mean you can stop them from saying it, but you should call them on it and the university should be positioned that way. And the one other thing I'd like to say, the more progress our society makes toward diversity, and certainly the birth rates themselves are gonna make that happen to some degree. There are gonna be large numbers of all diverse groups, or many, most diverse groups. You know, in, in a way, if the university persists and makes sure it does not, it does not um, tolerate, and I can't mean they can't, they can't have rules against it, but, but, but the university's policies do not tolerate hostility toward diversity. In other words, they embrace diversity. If that's done and the society keeps moving as it is, a lot of the problems will be taken care of. Um, I remember the women's movement, right at the, the height of the women's movement, that one of the professors, who now happens to be the president of a, a university in Minnesota, and she was a professor here for 25 years, she, she came into my office and she said, you know, you just don't have enough women in the top levels of administration here. And I said, you know, I've been thinking quite a bit about the women's movement. I said, look, Glenn and Ron and I are not going to resign so you can have our job. You know, we're just not going to do that. I said, but your, your problem, I grant you your problem, but do you know there are now more women in the PhD pipelines in the United States than there are men? There are more women going to college and then on to graduate school? You know, that problem is going to take care of itself. And believe me, it is beginning to. It is really beginning to. And uh, witness her as president of a university in Minnesota. So I think diversity ha has that future f for it. And we can never rest on our laurels. But if we keep fighting for the right thing, eventually it's going to be easier to have the right thing. Hello. I just uh, wanted to give you all a compliment on your suits and ties, because even I felt a little undressed coming to this event. <laughs> I didn't even know it was supposed to be that formal, so looking can, sharp, I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but for my question, I know a lot of people in this room can identify with me in terms of leadership and having leadership skills and qualities or being in a position of leadership. So I just wanted to know from you all's perspective, what does it take for someone to be considered a true leader? I thought I heard 11 maxims. Maybe, maybe he has a 12, I don't know. Do you want, let's see. I worked with a lot of different people who reported to me during the years that I was in administration. And I thought at one time, if I just worked closely enough with them, I could help them to become effective leaders. I want to tell you that there were some people that it was just impossible to make a leader out of them. It was just absolutely impossible. It wasn't because I didn't try, and it wasn't because they didn't try. 
but they didn't have one leadership instinct in their whole bodies. They really did not. And to some extent, um, the desire to be a leader, I think, is instinctive. It's inherent within you. You either want to be or you don't. And it doesn't mean that if you want to be, you'll be successful. There are a lot of ingredients that go into, into leadership. I always thought that one of the most important was have people willing to follow you. Otherwise, it's fairly lonely. I don't know if you get that or not. Um, but I, uh, I think that, you know, I've, I've sat in on a fair number of lectures, I think, on what are the ingredients of leadership. And I think that in all of those, the speakers had a key to some elements that were important to people who are leaders. But I think it really comes down to the individual because it's through that individual and the characteristics of their personalities that these things have to take place. And quite frankly, my experience is you either have it or you don't. Not all good leaders have the same characteristics. We might like to think that, and lots of books are written about the characteristics that leaders should have, but they're not all the same. Um, and so I guess I'd, I would just add a comment to Glenn's very good list from earlier and, and say that I think it's important for a good leader, most good leaders at least, to be empathetic to know the people they're working with well enough to help them maximize their strengths, overcome their weaknesses, enjoy their work more, feel, uh, not loved, but feel uh, involved, and uh, feel like this is a good place to be. So if you can figure out how to do that, you have to do it a little bit differently with each person. If you can have that kind of empathy, I think it goes a long way toward making a good leader. I agree with both of you. Uh, is there something you haven't said? Well, first of all, you have to want to be one. Some people do, some people don't. It's always unfortunate when some people, someone wants to be and then doesn't have what it takes to be. But you have to really want to be one. And I've noticed that some people, because of their drive and their smarts and their good fortune and their ability to maneuver politically very well, get to be leaders. Some of them are not very nice. Some of them are okay. Uh, but they're really seeking power. And, you know, leadership, when you're a leader, it's a, it's a reflection of, of you, who you are to some extent. It reflects that you really want to be in charge of something. So that's kind of the... That's a part of an ego. So I guess I would say for the most successful leaders, if you decide you want to be one, I think the ones that I've observed that I like the best and admire the most are ones who, in my estimation, have a realistic self-concept. A lot of people really don't know themselves very well. They want to be something so they think they are something or they want to be a certain way or sometimes they don't pay attention to the right things about themselves. They don't really know their personalities. Uh, none of us really know the way other, others perceive us. We don't know that completely. But the person who has the best understanding within herself or himself of what others are thinking gets to be a good leader. Another thing about leadership, if you're a leader, 
and we three were at this institution. And I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to be successful. I figure other people want that too. There are other people who want to be leaders somewhere around this institution, and there are other people, and all people want to be successful. So the leader's job is always to enable other people to fulfill themselves. Now, I'm not sure that's the way all leaders think, but that is my perception of what a good leader is. Thank you for being here. Uh, one of you had mentioned putting all your eggs in one basket. So why did you choose Grand Valley? What did you see in Grand Valley? Well, I saw different things in Grand Valley at different stages of my life. First of all, I saw a job. <laughs> and uh, at that stage, it was rather compelling. Uh, I just, well, no, I was, well, I needed a position, and, um, well, fortunately, it was a time when uh, there were jobs that were available, and um, Grand Valley was just beginning, and so I applied here. Uh, I, was, I was told by several individuals uh, not to come here, uh, that you don't go as a freshly minted PhD to an institution that's just beginning. Instead, you went to an institution that had some history and tradition, and uh, you tried to make your mark there. I've commented on this before, that I was sort of surfeited with advice by that point in my career, and I chose to ignore that. And so I came to Grand Valley. Um, personally, I, uh, I never expected I was going to spend a career here. I had thought that it was a good place to start, and it was also extremely beneficial to be part of an institution that was beginning. Commented on occasion that if any of us had known what that was all about, we might have gone elsewhere. Why? Because to start a university or start a college is a major undertaking, and yet uh, we were all, I suppose, a bit naive, and so we entered into that without knowing everything that we would have to do. But looking back on it, it was a tremendously enriching experience. There were a couple of other times in my life when I was thinking seriously about perhaps going elsewhere. And it was fortunate at those points in my life when Grand Valley offered me a different challenges, different positions. And so I accepted those, and as time went on, uh, really came to accept the fact that I was going to give my career to this institution. I had invested quite a number of years at that point, but it isn't time that you invest. What you really invest most of all is yourself. And I found myself increasingly invested in the future of Grand Valley, and that was enough for me to continue to stay. When I began, I, I, I came here because I was given an opportunity to start a department, a department of one person in a very tiny college, and that's irresistible from a career point of view. That was why I came here. That's not why I stayed, though. Um, I could say a lot of the same things that Glenn just did, and almost all of them are true for me as well, but I did want to make one comment about the character of this institution that I was never, I was never sure I'd find somewhere else, and that is it's more friendly here. I always liked the people I worked with, I not only respected them, but I liked them. And uh, some of you might remember that I said once upon a time, when you walk across Little Mac Bridge, notice how many people either smile at you or speak to you when you meet them on the bridge. And do you honestly think you'd find that somewhere else? Well, I came to Grand Valley because it was, a, it was the right time in my life. 
to take a new job. Um, why did I stay here? I stayed here because it was so interesting to be able to shape an institution. You know, many institutions have their traditions. They have their built-in politics that have been going on for years. And it's very hard for a president in some of those institutions to really make a mark. All the people want is the president to go out and raise money and let us spend it. Here, that was part of the job. But it really, I think, gave me a satisfaction. It's kind of the satisfaction of the ego that you can really make something here. You can, you can form it. You can create the traditions. You don't have to live with other people's traditions. You can help create them. And we had some false starts, but we always got things together. And then, as you said, friendly people. And then when, when you finally, over a few years, you get a team of people working together very well, that's a very happy circumstance. And that doesn't happen everywhere. So I felt, what, what, would I, what is more important? Is it, is it always to look to that next job and try to find it so you can be in a bigger place or make more money or something like that? No, that was not the satisfaction. The satisfaction came by being here a long time and putting a personal stamp on it. That gave me the greatest satisfaction. And that's what I was looking for. I like roots. I like roots. And uh, what I feel very good and about sharing with my colleagues here is when you when Glenn came and when Ron came and then I came shortly thereafter, I, this was a new place with not much of a reputation. And now look at it. It has a great reputation. Now, did we do that? No, none of us did that individually. But we were all key players in doing that. And I'll tell you, that gives you a lot of life satisfaction. Thank you so much for all those engaging questions here tonight. And thank you again to our three wonderful speakers this evening. It has been a delight to hear from each of you, um, leaving us with insights um, from the 10 Maxis um, to the importance of humor and laughter um, in relationships in our lives. Um, Don Lebers, you spoke about um, relationships and about how um, we should each pay attention to those who do shape each of our individual lives. And uh, we want to recognize tonight um, the legacy that the three of you had at Grand Valley and how you shaped Grand Valley. Um, each day, students benefit from that, as I did myself as a Grand Valley alumni. So thank you for your dedication um, to the institution and for being here tonight, sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. Here's just a small token of our appreciation um, for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to see what it is? <laughs> you <open them. laughs> oh. The person responsible oh. for, for the program tonight. Ah, the last lecture. The last oh. lecture. Thank you very much. You're that welcome. Thank you. This is our first Lessons from a Lifelong Learner program, but not our last. We hope this becomes an annual event that gives us an opportunity to bring distinguished GVSU community members to speak to our students, staff, and faculty. Please give our honored speakers, Ron, 
Glenn and Don, our hosts, Allison and Tom, our greeters, and all other students and staff that have helped make this program possible, um, please give me a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> 